we go ahead and get started again here. Do we have any, uh, any, any questions from anything we talked about already today? Please. Okay. Let me, um, let me maybe get... Okay. Um, I can answer the question at a very high level, and actually, I'll actually repeat the question, so it's fine. Um, the question was, what model is used for independent verification of, of safety assessment? It's okay, I just repeat the question. Oh, that's like, are you twisted? Oh, got it, okay, thanks. Okay, all right, thanks. And then you turn it off by pressing it again, right? Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna turn this off for now, but okay. Yeah. Press it. Keep the press and then we're off. Oh, there we go, off, okay, good, yeah. Um, the, 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 I, I'm gonna kind of defer the answer a little bit to next week because we have quite a bit of on, uh, on, on verification and validation. I mean, is your question more um, what kind of process to put in place or is it more the how to actually do it, more on the process side? Okay, all right. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. I like that question. Okay. I should have read that myself. Okay. Model for verification. Okay. Let me put this back over here. Ah, okay. All right. Well, I, re um, I repeated that question, Barbara, so it's, we don't need the mic. Today. Hopefully, I didn't just break the mic. Um, Look, I, I don't, um, I hate to kind of put this question, the answer in this perspective. I mean, there really is no one way to do it, I guess. And, and that's probably why you're having this discussion back and forth with your regulatory authority. But, I mean, it, if you think about process, uh, let me highlight a couple of things from experience that I'd recommend focusing on. Okay, one, again, is the interface between you and your vendors. Okay, and, and this is getting at not just, you're not talking about just verification of the codes, right? You're talking about verification of the model itself, the computer model itself, right? Okay. And the reason I want to focus on the interface issues are there are many opportunities for mistakes. You know, how the information flows from you to your fuel vendor, for example, and then back to you. You know, when, when they're designing a fuel product, for example, you know, your fuel over the years will change. You know, you're not going to be using the exact same fuel in 15 years that you're using now. You know, your fuel will change over the years. <clears throat> so you need to have a process in place to capture that change in your safety analysis, in all of the computer codes. And these can be simple changes, things like changes in enrichment. They can be larger changes, changes in the fuel, in, in the actual diameter of the fuel itself. You could uh, change um, the spacers in the assembly, go to more high performance spacers, things that, that allow you to have more, uh, what we call more thermal margin in the reactor. People use those for, say, power up rates, for example. They want to make more power. You have to have more thermal margin that you, so you can increase the thermal power of the reactor. There are, there are ways of doing that um, but by modifying the spacer grids themselves in the fuel assembly. You know, these are examples of changes that you have to capture in your safety analysis to make sure that the codes themselves are physically modeling the real plant. Okay, so that's one area where I would recommend, you know, definitely having, you know, having a process in place. Okay, the other part, I think, is, is independent verification. I, 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 I'm not sure how your organization functions, whether you do your own actual calculations in-house or whether you have a contractor do them. I'm, okay, all right, well, that's a very typical process. My, uh, in terms of process, I would advise that you have a procedure in place to, um, upon acceptance of the product from your contractor, you have a process in place where you independently verify the results of the calculation and the input to the calculation, how the calculation was conducted. Now, there are several ways of doing that. Some organizations I know physically have their own suite of computer codes. They run an independent calculation. Some people don't have that. 
In some cases, people go through and they physically inspect the numbers to make sure the numbers are correct. Um, sometimes you, I've seen people require um, a, um, a contractor to run calculations against, say, a known set of results to compare to make sure that you have confidence in what they're doing. Okay, there, so you know, there, there are many different ways of approaching that. Uh, but that's another area. I would, I would advise having a process written down where you actually go through and you, can, and you can demonstrate that you, as the operator, physically checked the input from the contractor. Now, you know, I've seen, in some cases, people physically write that into the contract to ensure that you, as the operator, get enough information to make that assessment. Again, I've seen situations where, our, where our organizations say, well, I can't, you know, can't do that verification because my contractor does, you know, doesn't give me the information that I need. Well, I would argue that you know, you're the customer, write it into the contract, that they will supply you the information that you need or make it accessible to you. They don't need to physically give it to you. You can you know, get on a plane and go to their office and do an audit of their information, but there should be a process in place to control that information. Um, you know, you need to think about, there, there, there should be a process in place for <clears throat> how you then go from the results of the safety analysis to how they're used in the plant. For example, you know, when you do a new calculation with a new fuel product, um, that could impact your technical specifications. It could change, you know, uh, like your DNBR ratio. It could change, um, you know, like the allowable insertion limits for your control rods, etc. Make sure that that information is properly translated into your operations department so ops has the right numbers. So when the operators are physically controlling the plant, they're doing it within the boundaries of the safety analysis. This gets back to this sort of man-machine interface question. You should have a process in place to ensure that that's checked to make sure that it's correct. Because the calculation's worthless if the plant doesn't operate as assumed in the calculation. And you know the tech specs change. They're not, you know, if you look at technical specifications of power plants, I've seen, you know, technical specifications of power plants literally over the 40-year lifetime of a power plant have changed a lot. <laughs> you know, not just in the numbers. I mean, sometimes new limits are established, you know, depending upon it. You know, if you change a fuel vendor, for example, you're going to get a whole new set of tech specs because vendors do things differently. And they're not going to change their ways for you. You're going to have to adapt to them. So these things, these things do happen. It's all about the process. So that's, what I, so that's what comes into my mind about things to think about in terms of the oversight of the process. And this has nothing to do with the codes themselves. Okay, if you're talking about computer code verification, then you as the customer, <clears throat> I would advise that when, when your supplier uses a computer code, <clears throat> you should have access to their verification documentation for that code. <clears throat> so you can go and independently oversee what they did. You don't have to do it. Make sure that they have, you know, the verification manual, you know, the QA manual to make sure that they're using the code correctly and that it's been verified and validated. Again, it's, it's not a matter of, of it's, you know, it's a matter of you as, as the customer and certainly you as the operating organization having the ultimate responsibility for safety. You know, it's incumbent upon you to oversee that activity. You, know, you don't have to do it yourself, but you should definitely audit it. And this gets back to you know, how you set up your relationships with your suppliers. You know, I would argue that there should be some, you know, some, that there, uh, there should be some agreement that gives you access to that information. You know, don't just take Relab 5 as a black box. That's just the example I personally know. There are many, many codes out there, but you know, Relab 5, speaking from personal experience, has a lot of problems. <laughs> Okay, and it, it's not to say it's a bad code, but it's to say you have to know how it's being used is the key. And you're responsible for it, well not you personally, but your organization is responsible for it. And so there has to be this relationship where you can access the information from the vendor, the contractor, and you can take a look at the verification and validation documentation and use your own independent judgment about whether it's adequate or not. So yeah, another area. That's a good question though, thanks. Any other questions?
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Gotta get the mic. Yeah, back up here. What did I do with it? Let me uh, bring it up here. Actually, would you mind running this up here, Or I almost yeah, thanks. You uh, maybe you walk faster than I do. What you are saying, uh, we have this kind of uh, procedure in Brazil now, okay. because you have a contractor from Argentine uh, industry, and now in my department we have the analysis of these documents, their documents. And it, uh, when I started starting this analysis, we found some, not mistakes, but not something, something not so uh, expected, and so we need to have some conversation between the constructor and our analysis team. And the other uh, consideration will be performed by the Brazilian Commission later. Yeah. So during the project, we need to have this kind of exchange experience in checkpoints to do, to analyze if it's, uh, what we are expecting to receive as a design is the same we are Imagine in the beginning when we going to contract to the industry or the the project manager. Good, yeah, and, and, and again, I can maybe just pan this down. Let me do it mine. Thanks. I think again that um, let me turn this off so I don't have any feedback here. You know, the, 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 this isn't about um, it's not about malice. It's not about blame. I mean, I can tell you, I've made a lot of mistakes with computer codes over the years personally. And I never took it personal when someone said, this is wrong, okay? It's a matter of we're all human beings, we all make mistakes. And the point is, we have to have processes in place to try to capture those. Because once they're in the computer model, in the computer code, they could live on for decades. I mean, again, from personal experience, I can tell you of some of the computer models that, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I was involved in, uh, in the creation of the new NRC code called the trace code, okay, which is sort of the Relap 5 replacement, if you, you know, uh, and one of the things we found when we started using the new code with the old input decks, the answers were totally screwed up. So what's wrong? Well, there was a problem. Well, what we uncovered is there was an error in the older software that had been there for 35 years. And it had just been covered up by the analysts who went in and corrected the error with input. But you put that into a new code and something goes completely wrong. So again, the point is, is exactly, you need to find these errors early. Because if you don't, they can take on a life of their own and they can be there for a very long time. Because after a while, you begin to just assume that what you get information-wise is correct because it's been through so many people, you just think that it's correct. So it's very easy to have these kind of mistakes. So again, this is good. All right, thanks. Good questions. Any other questions? And thanks for that thought. Okay. So let's move on here. So now we're going to move into um, a little bit deeper into what we call the fundamental safety concepts. Again, these are, embo uh, these are embodied in mainly in SF1, which is the, which is the high level IAEA document. But we're going to get into some other concepts here as well as we go throughout the rest of this presentation. Okay, so again, the, uh, the point of the next hour here is to go through and understand the fundamental safety functions and some key safety principles. All right. I want to point these documents out again, and you'll hear about these documents quite often throughout the next two weeks. Uh, let me just apologize up front here for the repetition, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, going to apologize to a point because we do this for a very good reason. And that is that these documents shouldn't, you know, these documents really truly embody, you know, decades of experience. You could almost argue decades of mistakes that then you don't have to make if you follow the doc, I mean, if you're able to implement these concepts in your power plants and your facilities. These are the representation of the best practices of the international community from many, many, many years of experience. Okay, so. This is what I'm going to go through for the next hour. Let me move on. I've already talked about this again, but I want to emphasize this one more time. Again, we are all safety professionals, every one of us. First, 
I argue. That's my argument. Um, and our job is to protect people in the environment from the harmful effects of ionizing radiation. Okay. Fundamental safety functions. Does anybody know them? There's three. Uh, come on, you got to know these. Anyone know three of them? What's the first one? Activity, right. What's the second one? Pardon? Well, uh, that, that, that's the concept overall. But we have uh, th three actual specific principles. Uh, cool. I heard of some are cooling, right? Yeah, cooling the core. What's the third one? Containment, confinement. Okay. Confinement of radioactive materials. Again, high level concepts, pretty easy to say, right? It's just three basic, what seems to be very simple concepts, not easy to do. And that's what we're here, that's what we're here to talk about. Okay, so control of reactivity. <clears throat> For those of you, obviously, who have worked in power plants, you know this very well. For those of you who have read about power plants or seen designs, you'll also know this. There are two main ways of doing this. We use control rods or some sort of a soluble, soluble poison concentration, boron being the most typical, which we put into our reactors. Um, we talk about cooling the core. We have to think about not, we, we, we have to think about many, many things. We can't just stop with the reactor itself. You know, we have to think about how we're going to get the heat from the fuel, the actual physical fuel pellet itself, the really small little pellet which is in each individual fuel rod from there all the way out to the ultimate heat sink. We have to think about how we can do that reliably. As we learned from Fukushima Daiichi, we have to think about how we can do it under many conditions, including accident conditions. How can we maintain cooling of the fuel? All right, that is a fundamental safety function, and it's not a simple thing to do. It involves many potential components, many, many, many potential accident sequences that we have to think about. Okay, so basic picture of your standard, typical pressurized water reactor configuration and the main components. All right, confinement. Now, again, we also have unfortunately seen several examples in the past of a failure to confine radioactive material. So, it is, so, so it's incumbent upon us to think about how do we confine radioactive materials inside, ultimately, the containment. We take a defense in depth approach here. We don't just rely on one system. We have a containment system, which is sort of the, the, the ultimate system in place to confine radioactive material, but we also have the, we have the primary coolant system itself. You know, it's, that includes, you know, the, the, the pipes and the pressurizer and the pipes and the steam generator tube sheets and all these parts, and we have to think about, and the reactor vessel itself. And then inside there, obviously, we have the fuel cladding, which I showed a picture of that earlier. So again, easy to say, not so easy to do. Okay, so. This is a point here where we're lining up some of the material from the documentation with the basic principles, so I'm not going to read every one of these. This is really more for your reference in the future, but this just shows you that, you know, we have developed information material to assist in demonstrating that we meet the fundamental safety principles, and this just kind of points to some of the concepts that are in, that are in the document. All right. Um, just to kind of go a little deeper into control of reactivity, I want to use a boiling water reactor example because really boiling water reactors are kind of a reactivity machine. I mean, that's really, it's really in part of the react. It's a very large part of the day-to-day -day operations of a BWR. I don't know if, if any of you are, are, are actually familiar with boiling water reactor technology. It's actually one of the things I've worked on mainly in my own career. Um, in mean, the BWR, you don't have any soluble poison. It just can't work because you're boiling the water right in the core. So obviously you can't put an acid in there, which is going to then plate out on the fuel surface. It's not going to work. So boiling water reactors are controlled by control rods. And also you control them with the speed of the recirculation pumps in the reactor itself. Again, these are different ways of approaching reactivity control. But the point is, is that from a safety perspective, what we're concerned about is not so much operationally, we're concerned about how do we ensure that the reactor is always shut down and, and can always be shut down with margin to safety under all conditions. And so, you, and so there are many different ways in a boiling water reactor to do this. 
um, several different systems. You know, some of the complexities in the BWR is the control rods actually come in from the bottom. So they're, they actually have to sort of, you know, they actually have to ha have the capability to reliably defy gravity. And there are systems in place to ensure with high reliability that, that works, okay? These are just some examples. Reactivity control operationally, again, in a BWR is done, for those of you who aren't familiar with, uh, with how, how these reactors operate, you control reactivity with a combination of the actual reactor flow itself and the control rods. So it's not just, you know, we're not just keeping the reactor pumps running at the same speed and changing the boron concentration. We're physically changing the speed of the pumps as the reactor operates to account for reactivity changes. This may be a more, uh, this may be an example of a system that you're more familiar with. Uh, again, this is, uh, this is actually a Westinghouse type system, which, which, is what, which is what I've personally worked on over the years. The point here is to show that reactivity control is more than, than just, you know, having, having enough control rods to ensure that we can shut down. We have to think about, you know, are we controlling the reactivity throughout the operation of the reactor to ensure that we don't have any hot spots in the reactor, things that we don't expect, things we didn't analyze. So we have to have in-core instrumentation. We can't just simply assume that the reactor's functioning fine and never take a look at it. All right, so it's very important that we're, uh, that, that, that we're constantly surveying the reactor to make sure that it's performing as we analyze, and again, the point here is, this goes back to the question we had earlier from our colleague from Pakistan about how do we transfer information from safety analysis to the real machine, the actual operational machine that the operators are looking at, you know, you know um, every day in the control room. <clears throat> they need to have a series of instrumentation in this reactor here. The instrumentation happens to come in from the bottom there are many different ways of approaching this. Some designers put fixed instrumentation inside the core. Some have probes that move up and down in the reactor. Some have instrumentation outside of the vessel, X-core instruments combined with in-core instruments, all different ways of approaching it. The point is, we have to be able to demonstrate that we are staying within the calculation, which is the point I wanted to make here, getting back to the question. We have a safety analysis, which is intended really to which is intended really to constrain operations. We want to uh, we want to constrain operations within an envelope that we've analyzed. So if I have an accident, I will be able to continue to protect the public and the environment. I mean that's the bottom line here. Okay, you know we can run our reactor above the envelope that we've analyzed. It will do it, but what happens if there's an accident? At that point, I cannot make the statement that I, that I have confidence <clears throat> that I will be able to protect the public and the environment because I'm no longer within the boundaries of my safety analysis. So, uh, let me pause here and ask a question if that makes sense because this is an important point and, and that's actually it's a great question. It sparked my thinking on this, so thank you. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? This is a very important concept. Yes, no, I'm not, I'm not getting a lot of confidence here. Let me try again. Okay, so the, 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 the reason why we have to have instrumentation, okay, is, is really quite simple. I run the computer calculation. I do the calculation, I get an answer, okay? Let's say I calculate that I'm able to have, um, a radial peaking factor of 1.25 in my reactor, right? That's, you know, how, if, if, if you think about the, the, the neutron flux itself radially, it's not just flat, right? It's gonna follow some kind of either, some kind of chopped cosine or some kind of strange, you know, multi, you know, multi-humped pattern depending upon our fuel management strategy. But it's not just gonna be one flat distribution. That's not physically possible. So I have to constrain that to a number. Let's just pick 1.25, the maximum allowed peaking. Well, how do I know that? Again, it's easy to run the calculation. The code is the easy part. <clears throat> I could get the number. How do I use it? How do I know that the reactor is within that boundary? 
So you're looking at it right here. Instrumentation. I measure the flux in the reactor at these given points, and I have a set of limits on the power plant. Some, you know, m most countries that I'm familiar with call them technical specifications. I believe there are some up, uh, uh, there is other set of terminology out there. Basically, it's like the speed limit sign, if you will. Okay, the reactor cannot operate beyond this number. If it does, there are a set of predefined actions that should be taken up to and including immediate reactor shutdown, okay, depending upon the severity of the problem. That should already be thought out beforehand. It should be in the technical specifications. But every single thing in there always goes back to the calculations, goes back to the safety analysis. And the key, again, is the linkage. And how do I know that I'm staying within my boundaries? Instrumentation. OK. Any other questions on this? Let me move on. Oh, shoot. OK, so core cooling. Um, these are just some personal examples that I'm familiar with once again. Um, there are several, you know, there are again many different ways of approaching the, the question of core cooling. The, the, the more modern techniques that you're finding in the new plants that are being designed by vendors and in some cases currently being constructed by vendors, you see more passive systems. Basically a bottom line, a passive system just relies on gravity forces to move water around the reactor. That's really, the, that's, that's, that's what it does as opposed to the old way of doing things where you had to rely on a pump, some active systems. The valve to open, you know, the actuator to open the valve, the, the pump has to start, uh, the pump has to run, you know, the, the, uh, all, all, all the valving systems on the inlet and discharge of the pump have to open. There's a lot of moving parts that have to work. So it's a, this, is, this is an evolution in design. Certainly leads to a more reliable result when you think about passive systems. Okay, these are just two examples again that you're going to find. There are many, many other ways of doing this. <coughs> okay, confinement of radioactivity. Again, um, I'm just going to bring in my own personal experience here. There are many, many different ways of doing this. This happens to be the AP1000 approach. Um, we think about confinement of radioactive materials, we're trying to ultimately protect. In the end, this barrier right here, which is, the, which is the containment dome itself. So we think about what we have to do in order to do that. We have to be able to remove energy from the containment. It can't just sit there forever. It will eventually overpressurize and fail. So we have systems. This is a passive system which is designed to cool through natural circulation forces the containment itself and remove heat. We also have to think about, under certain situations, we could have severe damage in the core. Again, look at our Fukushima Daiichi example. We're not, it, it's not known yet exactly the condition of all three of those reactors, but it's the, the, the general consensus is all three of them suffered damage to the lower head, and the fuel is somewhere in the containment, on the base mat of the containment in some form. We don't know at this point what, but that's the general consensus. So more modern thinking on that is, well, let's just flood the containment into those, uh, under those circumstances. Now this particular situation here is intended to try to protect the vessel integrity. This is a system called in-vessel retention. So we have water here, which is intended to transfer heat from the lower head into this water here, which ultimately comes up and will, uh, well, well, we'll ultimately make a heat transfer interaction with this surface and reject the heat to the environment. Other systems have other ways of doing it. This is a situation where I'm assuming, I'm just going to assume that the lower head fails. I'm you know, making an assumption the lower head will fail. So I'm going to try to capture the molten corium in this sort of, in what's called a core spreading area. But I, but I also have to think about cooling. I, I can't just let the material sit there. I still have to remove the heat. So I have a system in place where I, where I have water inside the containment, and I'm providing cooling of the material, which is ultimately, again, rejected to the environment. Now, there are, there, there are other systems. I don't have a picture of this, uh, where, well, which is called a core catcher. It's a system under the vessel head itself. 
and it's intended for, you know, uh, if we assume that the, that, that the lower head fails, the material will fall into this core catcher. It has material in it which will retain the corium, plus it has mechanisms similar to what you see here to remove heat ultimately from the core catcher to the environment. Again, it's an evolution in thinking from the early reactor designs, the point being we're trying to address the concerns with lower head failure and ultimately the loss of containment function by providing for more passive systems, be it any number of three different ways that I mentioned, and there may be other ways as well. I hate to prejudice an outcome to think through the process of fuel in the lower head, either trying to keep it there or go ahead and let the head fail but we'll, and, 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 and get the heat out to the environment. And the evolution in thinking again also is let's rely more on passive systems, natural forces, um, <clears throat> which should make that process much, much more reliable. <clears throat> okay. Ah, yeah, okay, so this is a picture that, uh, I, 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 I don't know where Yosef Mishak got this, but I, but I love this picture. Um, so a picture of defense in depth. You can see our mailman who unfortunately encounters the mailbox being guarded by three progressively larger, very mean looking dogs. The idea here again is, you know, we're not just gonna have, we're not, we're not, just, we're not, we're not just gonna have one dog protecting our mailbox, we're gonna have multiple dogs, because we, we really don't want that piece of mail in our mailbox. And in this case, we wanna keep the radiation uh, um, if we carry the analogy to the next level with inside the mail pouch itself. <coughs> okay, there's been many, many things written about the fence in depth. Um, INSAG 10, to my knowledge, is really the first place where IAEA really made a definitive statement on defense in depth. This was a document written uh, by the INSAG group. It's INSAG 10. They wrote that uh, the hierarchical deployment of different levels of equipment and procedures, and we're talking about the maintenance of the effectiveness of physical barriers, okay? Well, when I read that, what I think is, I think cladding, vessel, containment. I think, I think engineered systems in place to provide levels of defense and depth, okay? That's what, uh, that, that's what I see there. Um, we have to think about margins. <clears throat> You know, again, it, it, this business is, is, is all, you know, has many different factors. One of them is we never just assume that something is, is, is going to perform exactly as is written down on the specification. We have to think about the uncertainty in those parameters, the uncertainty in how the operator is going to perform. You know, again, put yourself in the control room at Fukushima Daiichi on March that day, 2011. How would we have performed? I don't know, but I can tell you that it was a high that, that was a high stress environment, and the, the the question of human performance needs to be considered because we have to think about that possibility, and we, and we have to try to model it in our safety analysis. <clears throat> and then we have to think about provisions of different levels, and and the independence of those levels. Again, as the thought process has evolved over the years, we think about the the installed equipment that we put in the plant to deal with our suite of design basis accidents. You know, the, the one that's again most commonly used that I'm familiar with is the large break loss of coolant analysis. We design equipment specifically to address that accident. Okay, but it's not the only equipment in the plant. Okay, so then the question becomes, and some of the current thinking is, well how do we put systems in place to deal with beyond design basis accidents? Okay. I'm not going to go into the details on that now, but it, it's just the evolution and the thought process. You know, should I, you know, and, and we think about independence, the safety standards argue that there should be independence in that set of equipment. <clears throat> now that can mean that I physically install extra equipment to deal with the more severe accidents, for example. There are other ways of thinking about that, and you know, we'll have more on that later in the, uh, uh, in, in the workshop, but the point is, is we can't it's it, the, the, the argument in the safety standards is that, it's, is that it, you have to have independence between the levels of defense and depth is the main point. <clears throat> okay, I've already talked about this. This is the kind of, I'll call it the traditional INSAG 10 model, if you will. <coughs> we have our three barriers, starting with the fuel cladding itself, the vessel, and then ultimately the containment structure, so I'm not gonna dwell on that. We've already talked about this, so let me move past. 
you know, this level of defense in depth is, is, this is basically the INSAC 5 level of defense in depth, and I know there has been some, again, there's been some evolution in this, and I'm kind of deferring on this, because we have some experts who are going to come and be able to talk definitively about the current level of IEA thinking on this that comes from our member states and the interaction that we've had through the uh, working on the latest revision of SSR 2 slash 1 with the introduction of design extension conditions and et cetera. So I'm going to go through this very quickly because I want to defer the conversation to our experts, one who happens to be in the room here today, Marco, and I know next at the end of the week Javier uh, uh, will also be here to talk about this in more detail. So this is kind of more the traditional INSAG 10 approach is really my point that I want to make. And this is also more the traditional INSAG 10 approach. I'm going to move past this as well. <clears throat> okay. So let's move into this idea of safety margins. Again, we, we don't, uh, do, do we have any experimentalists in the room, people who've done testing in the lab or large facilities? Anybody done any testing work in your career? No? Okay. Well, um, I've been involved in some testing over the years. And I can tell you that <clears throat> if I sit down and run a test <clears throat> twice, I'm not going to get the same measured answer twice. This is not going to happen. It's not possible for any real process that I'm going to measure for a reactor. Let's think about, you know, think about, you know, the simple process, what should be simple, of a process of, you know, boiling water. You know, we do it probably every day in our house when we're going to cook. That's one of the most complicated physical processes that I can even imagine, the simple process of boiling water. And you think about applying that to a reactor system. That's an added level of complexity because I don't have to, because, because it's not just boiling water. There's also, uh, there's also, you know, nuclear effects, there's structural effects, there's material effects. But the point being... If I'm going to measure, let's say, for example, let's pick one of the most important and critical parameters that limits reactor operations and also provides us a measure of safety. Let's look at, let's look at the DNBR ratio, or if you're a boiling water reactor person, it's called the critical power ratio, or the, uh, the MCPR. Okay, so it, it's basically the same physical process. I mean, what that really is, is it's the point, physically, where I stop having liquid water on the surface of the fuel cladding. I mean, that's really what it is physically. And what happens there is my heat transfer drops almost instantaneously orders of magnitude lower, and the fuel will rapidly heat up. I mean, that's the physical process. It sounds real simple, right? I can guarantee you it's extremely difficult to measure that parameter, OK? I mean, if you look at a plot I don't have one here with me, unfortunately, but if you look at a plot of, you know, measured critical power over a range of parameters, it, it literally looks like a cloud in the sky. It is not a straight line by any stretch of the imagination. There are many reasons for that, one of which is instrumentation uncertainty. Instruments are uncertain. Under these conditions, instruments are, are you know, have actually quite a bit of uncertainty. In them. Obviously, over the years, the instrumentation has improved, but there's still uncertainty in the measurements. There's uncertainty in, in, how I, in, in how I take the data from the measurements, and um, I'm sorry, uh, this distracted me here. I turned this off. How I take the data in the measurements and actually then, and actually then go in and correlate it. Okay, to the value that I'm going to put in the computer code. You know, I mean, I've seen I've seen data spreads that, you know, literally you, you just have a big blob of data and you could draw any number of six lines through it, and mathematically have exactly the same confidence in the fit of that data. So what are you going to do with that data? This is a question for the regulators as well. What are you going to accept with that data? What level of confidence do you need? So the point being is where I'm going to go with this is. We have to continue to, we have to provide for that uncertainty, okay? It, it is not a fixed known value, is the point. And there are many ways of doing it. I'm going to show you one example here, which is quite typical, uh, that, that, that we talk about. Let me just go through the end of this, and I'll talk through it. Okay. So 
the safety limit, let me just kind of work this from the top down. That's usually the easiest way to do this. The safety limit itself, this is where the barrier physically fails. Now, there's a couple different ways of doing it. Again, let's go back to our 1200C example, okay? Now, we assume that that is the safety limit itself. Not everybody does, but, but let's just, so let's, actually, let's go back to DNBR. That's a better example because generally, I think everyone accepts 1200 as, a, as an accepted value. Let's go to DNBR. Okay, well, DNBR of one means I have violated my departure from nucleate boiling ratio criterion, and I have gone into a critical boiling regime, and I should presumably expect the fuel will just instantaneously collapse, right? Is that true or not? No, actually it's not. I mean, just because the fuel physically goes through the DNBR threshold does not mean that it's going to fail. I mean, you know, it's an assumption made for a couple of reasons. One, it keeps me out of the extremely uncertain range of knowing what's going to happen. I have confidence if I stay with a DNBR larger than one, that the fuel will be safe. And it's a number that I can measure pretty well in the reactor, okay? I can take my instrumentation and I can actually use that instrumentation to determine relatively precisely what the actual DNBR in the reactor is. So those are really two very good reasons for choosing that parameter. But the point is the safety limit itself, the actual damage assumption, still has a level of conservatism in it. Okay, it does not necessarily mean that the physical barrier will really collapse. And this gets back at the cliff edge effect that we talked about. If I set my safety limit as the absolute failure point, I've just established a cliff edge effect in my reactor. And we don't want to do that. So again, the point is the safety limit is an assumption based on measurements, and it's an assumption that we use to as sort of the surrogate for the damage of the barrier. Okay, now, our, our regulators, <clears throat> being good regulators that we are, will always require some kind of an acceptance criterion. You know, we're not just going to take one as the value, right? I mean, what's a typical licensing DNBR? My experience is it's like 1.25, 1.3, something like that, as the actual limit that the regulator will assume. Well, that's, that's really done for a couple of reasons. One, we're all engineers. We think about factors of safety. Plus, it allows us to account for some of the uncertainty in the parameters. If you remember the, um, my description of the, the, the ability to physically measure the critical power in a reactor is a very complicated thing to do. There is always uncertainty in that parameter. It is never precise. We have to account for that uncertainty. And, and one of the ways we do that is we build it into our actual acceptance criterion itself. This is what our regulator is going to accept. Okay. So... <clears throat> Let's keep going down. Now we have a couple of different uh, margin. Let me try to understand what this is. Okay, calculated conservative value. Okay, so we'll get more into this later. But the point is, is um, there are a couple of different ways of doing safety analysis. Sort of the the uh, what we uh, what uh, we call the conservative approach. And then there's more best estimate plus uncertainty. I don't want to get into the details here because we have much more on that next week. This is just intended to highlight some, uh, with a little visual clarity here, the kind of expected values. Now, we would expect if we have a conservative value, ultimately that my calculation <coughs> is going to lead to a higher result, right? I mean, by definition, that's what, that's what making the conservative assumption should do. It should force the result to a higher value. And, you know, this, this is what you see here. This is, you know, uh, uh, because the operating parameter itself is going to be down here well below the, uh, what's on the PowerPoint. And if we think about the, the, the change in a transient state, we're moving up on this plot here. So the conservative value should always be higher than our best estimate plus uncertainty values, which if they truly are best estimate, should bound the real value. Okay. So I don't want to dwell on this because we have much more on this next week. 
But the points I want to make on this really are, A, we think about a safety limit, did not necessarily mean that it's a cliff edge effect. Okay, we don't want to have cliff edge effects. The safety limit itself is based on, on, on uh, testing and measurement, and that information is used to derive the limit, but that does not necessarily mean, again, that, that that is the ultimate failure point. And then the acceptance criterion itself, which is applied by the regulatory authority, is intended to encompass the uncertainty um, in some of the measurements. So, any questions? I know this was an awful lot of words, and I, and I promise there's more on this later, so this will make more sense. Yeah, please. Oh, hold on, hold on, need the mic. Actually, questions throughout the presentation are great. That's actually preferred for me, so. Oh, I'm confused about this slide because okay. the safety limit is a theoretical number. Right. Yeah? Well, it, it, it depends. We wouldn't call it a theoretical number. Um, let me think. In, some, I, it's, it, in, 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 in my experience, the safety limit is always derived from some level of testing. It's an experimentally derived number. Let's take the, um, I mean, what's an example of a safety limit that you can think of? For example, you have when you do, um, when you have uh, an accident that you, you analyze, yeah. and you have the criteria, general safety criteria. That numbers are the safety limit. Safety, um, can, you, uh, can you give me a specific example of a number? For example, DNBR. Okay. DNBR, when you analyze it by deterministic safety analysis one accident, you have, you have the initiating event, then you analyze it with relap, then you have some results. Yeah. These results are not the safety limit. Right. No, the results are these. These are the resulted numbers, depending on what approach you take. This is the actual result of calculation, if you will, what's in blue here. Okay, the blue lines are the calculated results. These lines up here are the results that are established by your regulator and by your testing. And these are the numbers that you want to make sure that you stay below. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, you're sure? Not just saying yes. Okay. All right. Okay, so again. If I run Relap 5, and let's say I get a DNBR ratio of 1.36724, whatever, that's this number right here. Calculated conservative value is that number physically that I get from Relap 5, okay? Now, the point is, I want to make sure that that stays above 1.3, which is this number. This is a number that was established by my regulator, and it tells me, and uh, they tell me I cannot go below that. I need to stay below that. Well, I, I, I have to stay below or above, depending upon the parameter. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right, yeah, yeah. I have to stay below the acceptance criteria. Yeah, this is the safety limit, and uh, there is another l number that, that I saw in, in a, another figure that's about allowable limit and uh, another one, uh, allowable safety limits and a lot of numbers in instrumentation slides. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Okay. All right, well, let me, let me, let me try to take it from a, from a calculational perspective, okay, again. Thank you. We, we uh, let me, uh, let me step back and try another, and try, uh, try another approach here. Um, Okay, let's go take a look at, um, <clears throat> let's look at large brake loss of coolant accident. Let's try that, okay? We establish safety limits for large brake loss of coolant accident. Now, the safety limits are in place to ensure the integrity of the barriers, ultimately, and the ability to, you know, to protect the public and the environment for the large brick loss of coolant accident. Now, now let's look at the common parameters. 
I, um, I have the 1200 centigrade for the peak cladding temperature. I have limits on oxidation, typically 17% oxidation limit. And then there's a global oxidation parameter. It's, I want to say, 2 or 3%. I can't remember the exact number. And, and that's sort of the entire reactor core itself. Okay, so those are safety limits. Okay. Now, those limits have been established based on literally, little, on, you know, literally hundreds of tests, experiments, which have been conducted <coughs> to calculate you know, what are the conditions at which the fuel will you know, lead to a point where I would expect it to begin to fail. In other words, I'm going to lose a barrier, okay? in this case, the cladding itself. Now, the point is 1,200C has been established as the peak cladding temperature limit. Now, the reason for that is really that happens to be the point at which, roughly, the zirconium oxidation reaction begins to become extremely, you know, rapid, okay? I start having this extremely highly exothermic reaction in my fuel which will, realistically speaking, if it keeps going, I don't stop it, it will fail the fuel. And if you look at a highly oxidized piece of fuel, I can literally go, go up with my fingertip and flick it like this, and it will just crumble. It has absolutely zero strength left in it. So I want to avoid that because my fuel will fail, and I will no lo longer be able to contain radiation w w within the fuel cladding. So we establish a limit. The limit is 1,200 C. That is <clears throat> this number right here. OK, that's the safety limit. That is the assumed failure point of the barrier, which in this case is the fuel cladding. And now, now, now the point I wanted to make is if you look physically at fuel cladding, you, know, you can heat cladding up above 1,200, and it can be subsequently quenched, and the cladding can still maintain its integrity, all right? So in other, uh, in other words, just because we set the barrier at 1,200, that does not mean if I go to 1,201, I will immediately have massive fuel failure. And the point there, again, is to avoid a cliff edge effect. I don't want to have my barriers right on the edge of the cliff, so if I move forward a little bit, I'm going to fall right off. Okay, that's the point of that barrier, or uh, uh, that's the point of that limit. Now, some regulators, not so much for 1200C, but for some regulators, you will, uh, you'll establish a limit which is a little bit below that. So you have a little bit of margin in there. And you will not allow the calculation results from RELAP 5 to exceed this parameter. <clears throat> and this gives you this little bit of margin in here between the acceptance value and the real physical measured parameter or value at which I assume fuel failure. So, does that make sense? Maybe? Okay, we have more on this next week. Okay, the point I wanted to make here again was really looking at the top two numbers here. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Any other shucks? Um, single failure criterion. Okay, this is getting more into how we do our calculations. Oh, uh, what you have to do is, is you have to hold the red button, and that'll hold it down, and that'll turn the mic off. Or I can do it if you can. You got it? There's a red button, and you just hold it in. Okay, so single failure criterion. Um, I mean, what this really, you know, uh, this is a single failure criterion in words, but let's talk about it by a physical example. Okay, we're all, you know, uh, let's think again about again. Once again, let me go back to my large break loss of coolant accident because it's really a very good example. I'm going to, you know, I have a physically capable system in my power plant, which consists of a diesel generator, series of high pressure pumps, large sources of water, valves, actuators, components. All, this, all these parts that allow me to inject enough water into the reactor to keep the fuel cooled if I assume that the largest 
pipe in the reactor just instantaneously breaks in half. I mean, that's what we, that's the, that's the design point that we put into our power reactors. Now, in order to meet the single failure criterion, I can't just put one system in the reactor. I have to put two in at least. Some designers even put more in. Some, I, some put three or four you know, levels of redundancy in their equipment in the plant. Because when I apply the single failure criterion, I have to assume that one of my entire systems is just simply doesn't work. Okay, and again, this is, a, this is a defense in depth concept. It's a conservative assumption. And it's there to add that added level of confidence in the results of the safety analysis. I think I have more on this here. Okay. Um, you know, this can be applied in many different ways. We think about electrical systems. You know, we assume a single component is faulty. I, I, you know, we'll have more on this later uh, uh, this week. But we think about electrical and INC systems. You know, I'm not just going to have one instrument, right? That's not going to work because I have to assume that one of my instruments fails if it's a critical component in the analysis. So I have to have extra instrumentation so I have multiple sources of measuring the same parameter. <clears throat> we talked about mechanical systems already. Uh, this, was the, um, this was the ECCS system example. Think about failure of active components, pumps, valves, emergency diesel generators. Think about passive systems. Well, some of the examples are, let's assume that I have a blockage of a flow. You know, let's look at our passive heat exchanger systems, okay? If I'm going to put a heat exchanger in a passive system, in other words, just natural forces, gravity forces, where do I want to put the heat exchanger tubes in the system? I mean, physically. Where's the point I want those tubes to be in order to have the largest potential for a flow? Anybody have any ideas? The highest point, exactly. Okay, but that has a problem associated with it. Okay, uh, do you know what the potential risk of having a, having a set of heat exchanger tubes at the very high point is? <clears throat> well, what happens if I get a bunch of non-condensable gases in my reactor and there's a whole bunch of non-condensable gases in the reactor systems, air, you know, uh, you know, if I have any potential hydrogen, for example, during, uh, uh, during an accident, if I have any, um, oh, I don't know, you know, gases from, gases, gases from accumulator injection, which, uh, which is usually nitrogen, well, where's that gas going to go in my passive system? It's the lightest substance, right? It's going to go right up into those tubes. Okay, well, what's the worst thing you can do to a heat exchanger? Non-condensable gases. Okay, so I got to think about that. It's a potential flow blockage. So what happens when I put non-condensable gases in my passive heat exchanger, and I have no means of getting them out of there? I have just failed my entire passive heat exchanger system. It will no longer work. Okay, so designers have to think about that. They have to think about the single failure approach to that. How do you design around that? basically making the assumption that this, that this passive heat exchanger is going to fail because I foul it with non-condensable gases. Again, these are, the, these are the thought processes that we have to go through. Okay. All right, let's see here. Um, I'm going to move past this. This is an example of a single failure, but I think we talked through this already. Think about applying the single failure criterion to human reliability. Um, is that what this is talking about? Yeah, exactly. Um, time must be 24 hours, unavailability, human error. OK. Um, this isn't just human error. We think about you know, ways, of account, uh, ways, of, um, ways to account for the single failure uh, criterion and or human error. We think about independence. This gets back to you know, let's assume let's not just install electrically driven pumps in our plant, put some steam driven pumps in. I have an independent source of the ability to inject water. If I lose electricity, you can still run a steam pump by physically running out and opening the hand crank on the pump. It will work. OK, this is an example of independence. They did that at Fukushima Daiichi. The reactor core isolation cooling system there worked for 72 hours in unit two with zero electricity. It's a steam driven system. It just kept running because they had the injection valve open and it just kept injecting water, doing its job for 72 hours. 
So it's an example of independence. Okay, redundancies. Some people, again, they put in multiple levels of redundancies into our systems. Um, and then another example is also, is, is also diversity, which I guess is actually the steam the electrical example. I apologize, but independence is, is, is having a physically independent set of equipment. So I misspoke there. Okay, um, here, uh, uh, this is a pretty busy picture. So I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Um, I want to focus on this a little bit here, though, because this gets into more of the physical concepts of separation. Here you see that equipment is physically located in different locations of the plant itself. And this gets at this idea of, you know, what if I have some sort of, an, of, a, of a challenge at the plant in one, in one particular part, maybe a fire or something locally within the reactor building. If I have all of my equipment in one place, it could all be failed by the fire. So let's think about the layout of the plant. Let's make sure we have that independence built into our design of the plant itself. Um, and these are just pictures of the different kinds of equipment which is in this particular facility. Uh, redundancy and diversity of ECCS. Um, let me, I think, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to go through this here pretty quickly because we, because again, we, uh, we have much more on this later. Um, independence, again, this gets, uh, this is just a picture from the US AVWR of how they approach it in their reactor. Okay. So the application of the single failure criterion, how do we actually apply it? It's not as easy as you might think. We have to think about what is the worst possible failure. I mean, what could, you know, what has the worst impact? There's a couple ways of approaching it. The more traditional approach has been over the years, we just run a series of sensitivity calculations. And we use that as the base of information coupled with engineering judgment to make a decision about whether or not this particular failure is the worst one. Now we're beginning to use more PSA insights, bringing that into the picture. Now that, now that we have that, that information available to us, we can use the PSA to inform us what's the worst single failure. It's just another source of information that, uh, that we have to use. Now, we also have to think about the sequence itself. It's not, you know, e each individual sequence, be it in this case, uh, we're talking about, um, we're uh, talking about fuel rod cooling calculations, or we can also talk about overpressurization in the containment. The phenomenology is different. The sequences are different. Most likely, the worst case single failure is probably going to be different. So this is not as simple as just assuming that I lose one train of ECCS for every potential calculation and I've covered the single failure criteria. No, this is not a simple thing. We have to put quite a bit of thought into it, quite a bit of preparation. Again, going back to the earlier parts of this presentation, this material needs to be documented, written down, so it can be independently evaluated, independently audited. All right, we don't want to just have one group of people making these decisions and not have somebody else take a look at it. So again, the, uh, the, uh, the point here is it's not as simple as it may seem from, uh, for, from the first look. All right, safety system classifications. Um, let's see what I want to say on this here. <clears throat> There's a couple of points to make on this here, but I, but I want to be a little hesitant going through some of this because, again, I'm getting back to some of the, the, the current evolution in this area of equipment and, and safety classification as we think about it in, within the context of the IAEA safety standards. And a lot of this, again, reflects some of the current thinking, uh, which, is, which is coming out of the lessons learned from Fukushima Daiichi and even some of the work that had been going on prior to the accident. But so let's, uh, let's start up, you know, we, uh, we have a body of plant equipment. I mean, this can be anything. Pumps, valves, uh, you know, actuators, water tanks, anything you can think of. You know, let's just put it into this body of plant equipment. Now, what has been traditionally done is we've broken those down into things we consider items important to safety, structures, systems, or components, and things that are not safety related. Now, now this is the area where I want to be a little hesitant because there are some thoughts you know, about whether or not we need to maybe consider 
how we can use some of this non-safety related equipment in certain types of accident mitigation. Again, I, I'll defer that discussion to the experts who will be here um, later in the week on this, but I want to be a little hesitant here with this discussion. Um, and then we can go down on the left-hand side under what we call items important to safety, and we have what we call safety-related items and then safety systems. Now, I think safety systems are pretty easy to define. Those are the items that are necessary to mitigate our set of, uh, our, our set of design basis accidents. Okay? If I make an assumption in a computer code that I need a particular valve to mitigate that accident, that valve is now a safety system. Because I have to, because that valve must perform as I have assumed in my calculation. And this gets back again to our discussion about going from the calculation to the real operating machine. Okay, the only reason we run calculations is so we can establish a box within which we want the plant to run. And that means for you know, all of our components, for example, you know, the safety systems, they have, to, they, they have to be demonstrated to perform as I assume. So that's really the distinction. Now, practically speaking, what that means is I have to establish a technical specification. I have, I'm going to have extremely high levels of quality assurance in manufacturing and procurement. I'm going to have uh, need to do you know, regular maintenance, regular surveillance, regular testing. That's what it means physically in the plant. And for our operators in the room, you'll, you'll, you'll know this better than I will. You, know, you have to do constant testing. And then, we have this, and then we have this category of systems we call safety-related items. Now, this is a little bit hard to define specifically. And, then I, and I've heard various approaches over the years of doing this. But let's take, for example, look at, um, look at the, uh, uh, the high-pressure air system in our power plant. Is high-pressure air a safety system? Is it safety-related? I mean, you know, the, 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 there are various interpretations, which is why I'm asking the question. Uh, okay, well, let's take a look at, again, let's go back to the Fukushima Daiichi example, okay? The safety relief valves on a BWR-4 Mark I system, that they require t t t uh, t two things to work. One is DC power, and two is high pressure air. You need to have high pressure air, the valve will not open. So is that a safety system or is it a safety related system? Well, I can tell you that in the BWR-4, high pressure air is a safety related system. It is not a safety system but it is necessary for the safety system to function. I must have some source, some, some source of high pressure air, be it a local attached accumulator, be it the regular instrument air system in the plant, I have to have some means of physically opening that valve. Okay, so that's just an example of what, you know, uh, for, uh, for, uh, of what from my own personal experience is a safety related system, but a very important one, it must work or you must have some capability of providing for the function or the valve will not work. Okay, so if we go back to the safety systems and we get down to the next level, then we're thinking about, you know, we have our protection systems, you know, reactor protection system, various sources of, you know, nuclear instrumentation, for example, is an example of a reactor protection system necessary to actuate the safety systems automatically to shut the plant down if I exceed a technical specification. Very simple, okay. Actuation systems are necessary for the protection systems to be able to physically actuate the systems themselves, and then I have a series of support systems. Again, some people would probably lump instrument air into a support system, some would not. It, it's, it's, um, it's a question open to interpretation. These are just examples. Okay, any questions on this? Yeah. Oh, actually, uh, would you mind grabbing the mic then? I think it has to be turned on. Oh, it's on. Um, it's on. Go ahead. It's on. It's on. on. What is the difference between safety-related items and support systems? Okay. That's a good question. And, and I, um, I cannot directly answer that question. That's a question that has to be, that has to be judged based on, on, the, on the individual requirements of a different member state. 
to what the regulatory body in the member state requires. But the examples of the systems are, for example, high pressure air is one that I know has gone either way. Certain countries require that. It's you know, a support system to a suit to us. I know. It's a, exactly. You know, it is a support system, but it has a safety function. So some people, you know, so, so it's approached in different ways. For example, if I know that I have a functional requirement for high pressure air on a safety system, maybe I'll require as a backup to have, to have a high pressure accumulator, you know, an air source there that will be reliable, that will allow the valve to function if I lose instrument air. These are just examples. But uh, there is no one way to answer your question. The point is it's a member state question that has to be worked out as the licensing process is evolving for a given facility. But that's just an example. Yeah, yeah um, I, I wish I could give you a direct answer, but, but there really is no direct answer. It's really more of a member state function. Go ahead, yeah. Okay, now this, okay. This is, uh, uh, of course, the terminology, I will go back to this during my presentation. Maybe I can give you uh, some uh, details because this is, is a, this represents what is in our safety standards. And some member states, they use different terminology. U.S. first, yeah. they, uh, safety-related item, items has a little different definition in U.S. So, but uh, remaining with the, the definition of the agency, safety systems are those systems that are necessary, Tony said very clearly, to mitigate, to deal with design basis accidents, nothing else. The same safety system is a complex structure. There is a protection system, normally is INC. <coughs> Actuation system, like control rod or whatever, valve, whatever. Yeah. And support system, like compressed air, cooling of the oil, cooling of the components. And also this part, in the terminology of the agency, are are uh, safety systems, are part of the safety systems. When we say safety related is a component or a system that if it fails can have an effect on safety, but is not for design basis accident. Example, the control system. The control system has importance to safety because if the control system doesn't work, you have to call into operation safety systems, for example. And this is a challenge to safety, but it's not a safety system. The fire protection system is important for the safety of the plant? Is a safety system? No. So there are system structures that have an effect in the, in, the, in the safety of the plant, but they are not there to deal with design basis accident. As I said, this is IAEA terminology. Right, yeah, yeah. I know that there are other, other interpretation in, uh, in, uh, in different countries, of course. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. I mean, I wanted to bring in a, a, the, you make the point that, you know, when these items are interpreted, different member states take different approaches. But, but that's a great example you brought up. I hadn't thought about the control system example. Yeah. Would you grab the mic, please? Thank you. So uh, according to... Uh, Marco's explanation. Uh, safety related system is not a safety system, right? And it would but, not yeah. affect the safety or yeah. and the operation of the. It's not okay, but if the safety related items fails, would the safety system operate or uh, function? Op yes. Yes. So why do we call them safety related items? I think a good example might be, let's go back to this high pressure air question, you know? I mean, you know, high pressure air is essential for certain valves to function, but if high pressure air fails, it's not a safety system traditionally, if, uh, if we use my personal experience here, because I have for valves that are safety systems, I have another source of highly reliable high pressure air that will be there 
to allow the valve to perform its safety function if I need to. I, you know, the, 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 uh, the main source of air, for example, for the safety relief valve is the, is the instrument air. That's where it gets its primary source of air. But for the safety valves, they have a backup source of high pressure, which I think is usually like nitrogen or something. It's not, it's not air, for example, to operate the valve if the instrument air system is not available. So it's not a safety-related system. In other, words, in other words, I don't have to shut the plant down if instrument air, if the instrument air system fails. I can still perform my safety functions. But it's going to challenge the system if it's, if it's called upon because then I have to use this backup equipment, I guess is kind of the point. And that, that, that's just another example. Uh, exactly, you know. I, I, I mean the right. Yeah. yeah. You, you know these concepts have have extremely practical reasons. I mean, you know we we cannot make every single component in the plan safety related piece of equipment. I mean, how many tens of thousands of little pieces of equipment are in your power plant? You, you, it, it's just not physically possible to do that because you cannot test every single component. You just don't have the resources to do it. So we have to build a body of safety systems that we will continually test, evaluate, to ensure that they are highly reliable and that we can, and that we can rely on them to perform their safety function. You know, we, we just have to make those practical determinations. You know, uh, we, 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 you know, we simply cannot make every single part of the plan a safety system. And that, I mean, that's just, uh, that's just another practical example but of, uh, of why this classification is done, yeah. Okay, thanks. Excellent questions. All right, well, I'll tell you what. Actually, that's the end of the presentation. So, um, not bad. We're a little bit early, but that's okay. So. Do we have any other questions? Anything that we want to go back over here? Because again, we, the, the whole point of this morning was to just introduce some concepts. We will go into every one of these items in more detail later. And the areas where I was a little cautious is really because I want to give you the opportunity of having the benefit of the real experts speaking about these issues because we have been doing quite a bit of work in the agency working on updating our safety standards to reflect some new thinking. And we have the experts here this week who will be able to share you know, what is the current thinking, what are the current practices in these areas. So that's why I was a little hesitant to get into some of these details right now. Um, again, oh, question, yeah. Um, do we have the mic somewhere? Can you pass it up there, please? Thank you. Sir, I have a doubt on single failure criterion. So they are actually a failure of one system, whether it is called a single failure criteria or a failure of a components in the system is called a single failure criteria. For example, suppose SDS1 fails, then there is another shutdown system there, shutdown system 2. So whether we will call it a single failure or a failure in some, uh, some rods in the uh, prime, and the SDS-1 will call be single failure. Okay. Well, well, the way I would interpret that, um, I, believe you, um, I believe you're referring to like the can-do example, right? They have the SDS-1 and uh, SDS That is actually, uh, so was one shutdown, there are two shutdown systems. Okay. So one shutdown system fails. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there may be some, uh, some control, some, some elements. So two, one element fails, then, the, then that shutdown system will work. Okay, all right. I think I understand the question. Uh, the, the, the way that I would interpret the single failure criterion as applied to the reactivity control system or the, 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 the shutdown system is we would assume that the entire system fails. And we need to have a backup system which has a completely 100% redundant capability of providing shutdown. Uh, that's how we would interpret the single failure criterion in that situation, yeah. And then, sir, in that, uh, that is means one system fails then there is another backup system is there. 
So that is called single failure. Yeah, yeah. Now, suppose in the case of fast system, the fast system, there may be one component fails, but then the system can take care itself to perform the intended function. What is it, uh, the, 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 uh, the which system, PA? Uh, uh, that suppose one, one system, uh, like one protection system, if you take, okay. in protection system, there are so many uh, rods are there in uh, mechanical rods. Okay. So if, if also uh, some rods fails, then that the protection system can function. Okay. You know, let's talk about the, the reactivity control systems are difficult to talk about in terms of single failure because typically regulatory requirements, you know, require that, that that extra level of redundancy because reactivity is kind of a unique thing. Let's, uh, let, let's talk about, say, more of like the, 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 the uh, um, water injection systems. That, uh, that's a better example, I think, to talk about single failure. And let's take a look at, let's, uh, you know, we have to assume, let's say we assume that the single failure of the, the worst component in a system for the emergency core cooling system in the reactor. And that's generally uh, uh, one of the obvious ones that comes to mind is we assume a failure of the emergency diesel generator that powers that system. The entire system will not function. Okay, uh, that, that depends on the electrical configuration, but if we make the worst case assumption, we're assuming that one of our entire ECCS trains is now, is now not available. So I have to have a completely redundant system in place in order to address that. And the reason why there's a distinction between that and the reactivity control system is reactivity control systems tend to have a specific regulatory requirement which requires the level of, the, the extra level of redundancy you're talking about. In other words, having a backup system. Whereas you get into the other components in the plant they don't typically have that kind of requirement. And what, what usually leads to this level of redundancy mm -hmm. is the application of the single failure criteria. I mean, that's the distinction. Does that make sense at all? It's hard to talk about reactivity systems because then you talk about is a single failure the assumption of one control rod not working or two control rods not working, for example. That, 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 that's a very difficult example to really bring in. Um, I think it's better to talk more on the other systems. So, yeah. Any other uh, any other thoughts? Questions? Everybody's hungry. Question. Oh yeah. My question is that the single failure criteria, it is applicable to all plants uh, in the world. Uh, there is uh, also any other, uh, for example, two system failure criteria in any plant. Well, I mean, the, the single failure criterion should be applied at all plants in, yeah, in the world. I mean, that's what the IEA safety standards require, yeah. And certainly good practice requires that. Uh, you don't need the safety standards to come to that conclusion, yeah. But that's what the safety standards would require. Now, the implementation of it is is certainly, you know, is, is where the discussions come in, and that's obviously the member state responsibility to implement the single failure criterion using their own experience, using the safety guides to the extent possible to come to a consensus within the member state on how to apply the single failure criterion. Yeah, but, but, it, but, but, you know, uh, but, uh, but it is certainly an absolute requirement, yeah. Yeah. Questions? No, yep, yeah, up there. Uh, you previously mentioned uh, there is a uh, regulator body accept a safety margin margin concept. So, what is the current practice of regulatory body? Uh, the margin rate in terms of uh, percentage of a uh, single failure uh, in reactors. Okay, um, I think we're mixing up two concepts there. Uh, the single failure criterion doesn't really have an impact on the margin. In other words, I'm assuming, uh, actually, let me go back here to this margin picture. Maybe, the, maybe that's not a good idea, but let me try this here. Um, oh, here we are. When we talk about safety margins, we're not talking about the single failure criterion at all. In other words, 
we're going to make these assumptions, you know, regardless of the single failure criterion. I have to be able to meet these assumptions even by assuming the single failure criterion. So um, in effect, it's an additional level of defense in depth, if you will, which we're adding. Because we're adding in, uh, on top of, for example, this margin that I'm just adding in here by the regulatory authority between the acceptance and the safety limit to account for uncertainties, you know, to account for good engineering practice. I have to meet this margin even by assuming the single failure criterion in the calculations. <coughs> so uh, does that answer your question? I, I, I mean, they're two different concepts, as the point. And one is not related to the other, because we want to have that additional level of conservatism, basically, is what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah, we have a question in the back. Can you, can you pass the mic up, please? I just wonder if you have a presentation about how you, uh, IEA classify the systems and components. We do, uh, yeah. Yeah, safety class one, two, and three. Well, yes, yes. I don't think it's going to go into the, I, I, I don't know what level of detail you're planning on going into, Marco, but I know you have a presentation on it. Yeah, yes, yeah. okay, thank it's you. Tomorrow, yeah, yeah, definitely. Again, we wanted to introduce concepts this morning, and we'll let the real expert uh, talk about it tomorrow, so. Okay, question, please, yeah. Well, this uh, single failure criteria, is there any discussion or statistical data about that uh, how, at how many plants, uh, because of this single failure criteria, the second system coped for the safety system? <coughs> Hope you understand what I am saying. That, I understand, uh, yeah. We have, of course, around the world, mostly single failure criteria is applied. So many systems, backup systems are there. Have we ever analyzed or do we have any statistical data that one system failed and the second one coped? Not to my knowledge directly, but I know that this is the kind of information that would be captured in a PSA model. We'd look at equipment reliability, and that information would be captured in that process, and then that could be determined as part, and that, and that information could be basically fed back into the process to help us identify whether I properly captured the worst case single failure because equipment reliability, for example, you know, you know, might impact my thinking. I, 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 you know, it, it, you know, may or may not. But this is the kind of information I would expect to see in a PSA, for example, yeah. But, I, I, you know, I don't, have, I, I don't have any specific knowledge of any statistics looking at that exact question, though. Yeah. <clears throat> any other questions? Okay, so with that, I think we're, we're done with, actually, we're right on time. Uh, we're ready for lunch break until we'll come back at uh, 2 p.m. Back to this room, right, Barbara? Yeah, 2 p.m. here. And the, uh, the cafeteria is... Okay, so thank you very much. See you at 2. <coughs>